Hello and welcome to the video lecture for um, canine illnesses. So uh, the first illness that we're going to talk about is canine viral distemper. Um, so uh, it, the abbreviation for that illness is CVD. So CVD is caused by the canine distemper virus. Um, so remember we talked about the differences between like viruses and bacteria, right? So um, this one is definitely a virus. Uh, incubation period on um, canine viral distemper is 10 to 14 days. So remember the incubation period is the time between first contracting the virus or coming into contact with it and starting to show clinical signs. So trans for transmission, um, how it's spread from animal to animal, it's usually spread uh, via airborne aerosol particles. Um, and it is, uh, the wildlife is considered a reservoir for this illness. Uh, it can be transmitted in utero as well, but that's not very common. Uh, typically animals that have distemper usually die from it. Um, so clinical disease, which means uh, how long that the animal has the illness for. Oh, sorry, I'm just trying to adjust my stand here so it's not blurry for you. Uh, so how long the animal has the illness for or showing signs can be between 2 and 12 weeks. So the systems affected by viral distemper are um, the respiratory system, uh, the GI tract, and the CNS, which is uh, the central nervous system. So if, um, if an animal is showing central nervous signs, they are most likely going to die. Uh, so typically if it gets progresses to that point, that is definitely a sign of death. So canine, <clears throat> sorry, canine viral distemper has two, um, I guess, phases of clinical science, I guess is the term I would use. So acute, remember acute means a sudden onset and it, that it's short lasting. Uh, the acute signs of viral distemper are fever, leukopenia. So the definition of leukopenia is an insufficient amount of white blood cells. Uh, anorexia. So what does anorexia mean again? It means not eating or a lack of appetite. We'll see a cough or ocular nasal discharge, which makes sense if the respiratory system is affected, right? Um, lethargy, so they're feeling tired, vomiting and diarrhea, ataxia, which remember means uh, stumbling or walking unsteadily, paralysis, which means not able to use the legs at all, blindness, uh, seizures. So the seizures that these dogs show is very unique. Um, like it's not your typical, uh, you know, looking like they're running kind of seizures. Um, it's, a, it's called a chewing gum fit is a, the, I guess, um, common term for it. But it's a unique type of seizure seen with uh, viral distemper only. It just looks like they're chewing gum. Uh, so um, canine viral distemper can't, so the animals that survive and live after having uh, this illness are affected by chronic uh, clinical signs. So we'll see things like enamel hypoplasia. Um, enamel hypoplasia means that um, like the enamel of the teeth are um, insufficient, uh, like insufficiently growing, right? Hypoplasia is um, a decrease in growth. Uh, their teeth will be yellow and they'll have hyperkeratosis, uh, which is um, a hardened, hardened skin on the nose and the pads of the feet. Um, so yeah, the note here is hard pad disease and, and nose. Uh, so is this illness debilitating? Um, yes. So it's either going to kill the animal. Um, I think 90%, yeah, 90%, up to 90% die. The ones that do recover are chronically affected. Uh, so chronically, remember, it means that um, they're affected for life. It's an ongoing issue. So the animals that are chronically affected often have a loss of their senses. So like we talked about blindness um, as one of the acute clinical signs. They might have paralysis uh, and they could have severe CNS signs. So central nervous system signs 
pardon me, and since it is a respiratory illness, it could cause uh, chronic pneumonia as well. So yes, I would say this is a very debilitating disease. Most of the animals die that catch it, and the ones that don't um, are really debilitated for life. So how long is the virus shedding uh, from the system? Um, it is shedding for, for weeks after clinical signs disappear. So even if the animal has recovered, uh, they are still shedding that virus and could spread it to other animals. So how do we treat viral distemper? So I ask you now, how do you treat viruses? Well, you don't. Remember, there aren't really um, antivirals that are available very well anyway in, um, in veterinary medicine. So typically, um, like if you have a bacterial infection, you would treat with antibiotics. Unfortunately for animals with a virus, there's not really um, like an antiviral medication that we can reach for in veterinary medicine. So since we can't treat the actual virus, we're going to offer supportive treatment. So supportive treatment means that we're just treating the clinical signs that they have. Uh, once the clinical signs um, are involving the central nervous system, though, typically the treatment is going to be euthanasia because that animal is really likely to die if they're showing CNS signs like seizures and blindness and paralysis. So is there a vaccine available for this virus? Yes, hooray! And it is part of our core vaccine list. So if you have a puppy, your puppy should be vaccinated for distemper at 8, 12, and 16 weeks. Then we'll booster it one year later, and then you give it every two to three years after that. So what if a pup gets distemper? So if it contracts distemper in utero, where they get it from the mum, uh, it's pretty likely that those pups will abort. Um, if they do get born, um, they will likely die within a few weeks of birth. So if, if they're infected as a puppy, it's extremely unlikely that they will live. So reoccurrence, as in can you catch this again? Um, you are technically immune probably for a period of time, but apparently you can catch this illness again. Or, well, not you, but a pup. A, a dog could, it could reoccur in a dog. Um, and at that point, I would say that that dog with a chronic, um, like chronic viral distemper is going to be really immune compromised. And the likelihood of them surviving a second time is pretty unlikely. Uh, so how do we diagnose viral distemper? Well, we're going to look at clinical signs and history. That's pretty common and typical to diagnose most things. Um, there is an antigen test. So an antigen test is going to test for the presence of that virus. It's looking for the antigens on the distemper virus. We could also do a viral culture. Viral cultures are sent out to outside labs uh, same with the antigen test. We can't do those in-house. Uh, we could run a CBC in-house, a complete blood count, and that complete blood count is going to show uh, little to no lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are a type of white blood cell. Um, so prognosis, we kind of talked about already, right? 90% of animals affected by viral distemper are going to die. Um, if any of those animals do survive, they are affected chronically for life. So it's not a great prognosis on this one. So environment, we're asking the question under environment of um, how long does the virus survive in the environment? So it is fairly stable. It will survive a few hours at room temperature. So it is possible for that thing to get spread around a fair bit. In the wild outdoors, it can last weeks to years in colder temperatures. Hmm, do we know anywhere that's cold? Oh yeah, Manitoba. <laughs> so uh, during the winter, it can last a really long time. And then uh, bleach fortunately will kill this virus. Um, pr same with uh, probably, I'm sure anyway, I'm just honestly guessing but I feel fairly confident that um, like peroxigard, your accelerated 
hydrogen peroxides would kill it as well. Uh, and then zoonotic? No, it is not zoonotic, although it is related to measles in humans. So it is possible to have a subclinical infection. Uh, however, if you do have the measles vaccine, which if you had your typical vaccines as a child, you probably have had, um, and that is protective for humans. So canine viral distemper is one of those viruses that we really want to vaccinate against because it's of its severity. Uh, so remember we talked about back in our last lecture um, what illnesses we want to vaccinate against and um, severe illness is one of those and viral distemper is definitely a severe illness. So if we can prevent animals from catching this, um, it's much better than them most likely dying or if not dying, uh, being badly affected for life. Okay, so moving on to our next illness, canine parvo is caused by the canine parvovirus or CPV. Uh, so incubation period on canine parvovirus is five to 14 days. So between catching the virus or being exposed to it and showing clinical signs, five to 14 days. Transmission is mostly fecal oral. Uh, it can be spread indirectly via fomites though, so like on your clothes and your shoes. Um, so you wanna be careful if you have a parvo puppy in clinic that you are making sure you wear your protective outer gear and take it off um, in between and like make sure you disinfect your shoes and stuff in between handling parvo puppies and regular patients. Uh, we will talk about in our fourth unit, we'll talk about isolation protocols and how to prevent that spread because we certainly do not want to be passing parvo around the hospital. One thing um, I'll usually do too is we'll assign one tech to work with a parvo puppy and we don't let anyone else work with the parvo puppy and that parvo puppy tech doesn't work with any other puppies because then we, we have one more additional layer of protection uh, between spreading around that illness. Um, clinical disease. So typically it is fairly short-lived because if they have not shown improvement after four days of treatment, they usually don't survive. <sighs> So I don't really have an answer for you. Untreated, like a day or two, if they are being treated and make it past day four, they will usually, um, they'll, they have a better chance of survival anyway. Uh, I would say typically a parvo puppy is hospitalized likely about a week if they're showing improvement and getting better. So what systems are affected? It's mostly the GI tract. Um, but it will start to cause problems with the heart, the bone marrow, and the immune system as well. Uh, and eventually it will cause septicemia. So septicemia, septic, right? We're thinking um, like infection. Uh, when we talk about septic, like dirty, right? And emia is a blood condition. Septicemia is basically a systemic infection in the whole body. Uh, since the immune system is in, is in uh, affected, uh, we tend to see a really bad um, proliferation of bacteria then in the blood. So clinical signs, if caught as an adult, usually they're not going to show a lot of clinical signs. Adults are considered a reservoir for the parvovirus. Pups, on the other hand, if they catch it as puppies, uh, we're likely going to see bloody diarrhea. We're going to see vomiting. Fever, they'll have low white blood cells and that's why the immune system is affected. Since they have so much diarrhea and vomiting, they're gonna be really dehydrated and lethargic. They are not feeling like eating because of the diarrhea and vomiting, they feel terrible. Uh, it is possible for them to get an intestinal intussusception. That is when the small intestine telescopes into itself. So picture um, like 
you know, like a, let's say like a camera lens where it's telescoping or like a telescope that's telescoping, right? It's like the bigger parts, the small parts like fit into the bigger part, right? That's what intussusception is. So basically like the intestine kind of folds over on itself. So that um, causes a cut off of blood supply to the intestine. And then we start to see uh, necrosis in that area and those small intestines could, um, that portion could die and it could rupture. So that's one cause of death. We can also see septicemia, right? So we talked about that already, um, systemic blood infection. And uh, they often have what I have it in quotation marks here, a parvo smell. So parvo has a really distinct smell. Um, I, I find it kind of hard to describe. It's like kind of metallic, but sweet at the same time. It's like a sweet smell. Um, it's really disgusting, honestly, and it's really distinct. Um, like you'll smell parvo for the first time and you'll never forget it. Uh, it's something I have never smelled anywhere else and um, it is a really unpleasant smell. Uh, so often we'll have pups come in for diarrhea and I'll walk in the room and we haven't even done an exam or a parvo test yet or anything. And I'm like, it's parvo. You can smell it. It smells awful. So question, is this a debilitating illness? Absolutely. Um, untreated, the animal will certainly die. Uh, if they are treated, they may survive or they may not. Um, like we said before about how long the clinical disease lasts, if they're not improving after four days of treatment, usually they will die. Uh, fortunately, it feels like treatment is, um, like there's a really solid treatment plan now for Parvo where a lot of those puppies will survive now, which is nice. Unfortunately for them though, they end up being a chronic poor doer. Uh, so they're more likely to get sick with other things. Um, they're kind of just, um, like, you know, people say like cars, like a car that breaks down all the time is a lemon. Uh, like I kind of jokingly call poor doers lemons, right? Where they just kind of have a lot of problems. Like if they have parvo, you'll see them in clinic often for other things after the fact. So the parvo virus is shed for the duration of illness and then for two to four weeks following infection. So even after that puppy has gone home because they've, uh, they've, um, what's the word I'm trying to look for here? Recovered. They've recovered after treatment. They are still potentially shedding that virus. So that means that they can infect other animals. So uh, ideally the owners should be um, not taking their dog for walks. That animal should not be defecating anywhere in public or anywhere around other dogs. And the owner should be disinfecting um, any areas that the animal does uh, move their bowels. So we, we definitely want to not infect other animals. So it's really important to give that information to owners that for about a month after going home, they should really be disinfecting any areas and not taking that dog for a walk. So how do we treat parvo? I alluded to it being um, like a pretty rock solid treatment and it is. So, um, well, first question, can we treat the virus itself? No, we don't really have antivirals that we can use to kill off the canine parvo virus. We can, however, give supportive treatment, which means that we are treating uh, the clinical signs that we're seeing. So dehydration, we're gonna treat with IV fluids. Septicemia or other infections, like we're gonna be um, pretty uh, proactive with the antibiotics to fight off any pending infections. We can give them antiemetics. So antiemetic prevents vomiting. And we usually do plasma and blood transfusions. Typically those are gonna have some antibodies in there that can help to fight off those viruses. So they're getting that um, acquired immunity. Uh, and that can be really helpful for them. And we want to have them strictly NPO. What does NPO mean? It means nothing by mouth. So we don't give them any liquids, no water. We don't give them any food. Uh, once we start seeing them really showing uh, signs of recovery and improvement, the doctor's gonna advise that we really slowly reintroduce food to the animal. 
Uh, we want to select a food that's really easily digestible so that uh, so that that we're, we're not like putting any, any undue stress on that digestive system. So as you can imagine, that GI tract is really suffering after having a parvo infection. Like basically the entire thing is just ruined. So it's not going to be working very well in terms of absorption and being able to digest food. So the better quality, easily digestible food uh, is going to be the best choice for those pups. And we're going to give it to them really, really slowly. Like we, we're talking like minuscule amounts at first. And we'll really slowly start to reintroduce that food as long as they're handling it okay. <coughs> uh, okay, so vaccines. Is there a vaccine for parvo? Yes, hooray. And it's a core vaccine. In fact, canine viral distemper and canine parvovirus are packaged together as part of the DA2PP vaccine. You can get a parvo vaccine on its own as well. So it is core, which means all dogs should get this vaccine. It's given on the same vaccine protocol as distemper, which makes sense because it's packaged with it. So we're giving it at eight, 12 and 16 weeks for pups. They get a booster after one year, and then every two to three years, we're going to booster that vaccine. So there are some breeds that are at higher risk of contracting this um, virus. So it tends to be your dogs with like um, that black and tan coloring. So think your Dobermans and your Rottweilers. They're at a lot higher risk of contracting Parvo, and they're a lot... Um, a lot more affected by it as well. They have more severe illness. So those breeds are considered high risk and, um, and it can be a, a good idea to give them a, a fourth booster as puppies and, and give that booster at 20 weeks. Uh, so pups are usually the animals most affected by this illness. Uh, and typically we're gonna see pups coming in between six and 18 weeks. I find it tends to be usually younger because um, they haven't been vaccinated yet. Uh, if we see older pets, like I find for the most part, people are pretty conscientious about vaccinating their puppies. Um, so usually we're seeing like those younger animals showing up with that. So recurrence, is it possible for um, an animal to contract parvo again? So likely after having had the virus, the animal is probably immune for a period of time. Uh, it could even possibly be years, um, but I don't think anyone's actually done any research on how long that immunity lasts for. So even if an animal has had parvo, we are still going to go ahead with vaccinating them because it is possible for them to, to uh, have a reoccurrence of that parvovirus if they did um, contract it during a time when they are susceptible and don't have that immunity any longer. So how do we diagnose parvo? Clinical signs and history will certainly give us um, a really good tip, right? Clinical signs, I smell that parvo smell. I'm pretty certain it's gonna be parvo. Uh, a puppy with diarrhea, we haven't even seen the animal yet. I'm assuming it's parvo, right? Uh, so those clinical signs in history are gonna give us um, certainly a good idea of what we're dealing with. But to confirm it, we can do uh, IDEX parvo snap test. Uh, so a snap test is, um, it's an ELISA test, E-L-I-S-A. It stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Assay means test. So it's just a type of test. Um, and what it's looking for is uh, it identifies if there are antigens of parvo in the stool. So it's looking to see is the animal shedding that virus. If they're shedding parvovirus, they have parvovirus. So we can do an IDEX parvo snap test in-house. It takes eight minutes to get results. Beautiful, so fast, we love it. We can also run a complete blood count, a CBC, and we'll see that white blood cells are extremely low. Uh, so as a result then, the animal's immunity is compromised, right? We learned that white blood cells are responsible um, in, in 
part for a lot of the immunity stuff that we um, that we see happening in the animals. So if they don't have those white blood cells available to fight off illness, uh, the animal is not going to be able to fight it off. Or sorry, prognosis with no treatment, the animal is going to die. It's fatal. If we can catch it fairly early, we're going to have a better likelihood of survival um, with treatment, of course. Um, but if we don't um, catch it early, like if the animal's been having diarrhea for a few days at home and, the, and they only bring them in when they're like pretty flat out, it's pretty likely that they will die. But if it's caught early and we do that, um, that treatment, likely they will survive. Most of them will. So um, with treatment, it's, it's a fairly good prognosis, but no treatment, it is fatal. And I will let you know that treatment for parvo is expensive. Uh, you're looking at over a thousand dollars for sure. Uh, so it doesn't save you money to not vaccinate your animals because if they catch something like this and you want to treat it, it's going to be pricey. I have seen owners have to make the call to, uh, to euthanize their puppy because they can't afford that treatment. And that's really sad. Uh, so ideally we would like to see puppies get vaccinated so that they don't catch these things. So the virus in the environment Indoors, it can survive about a month. So please let's uh, really make sure that we're disinfecting really well after uh, having a parvo puppy in clinic. Let's talk to our owners about how they need to disinfect their house uh, indoors and outdoors so that they are not, um, you know, contaminating and then spreading it to other animals. Uh, freezing protects the virus. Hmm. Freezing in Winnipeg? Yes. <laughs> so that is not great. We are a wonderful place for um, for that virus to hang out and stay because we do have those periods of freezing. So shady areas, that virus can survive outdoors for about seven months in a shady area. In a sunny area, it can survive about five months. So if we think about a little cute little parvovirus hanging out in a sunny area of the dog park, it hangs around there for five months in the sunny area. So that's summer, right, in Winnipeg? And then we turn into winter where it's freezing. So that protects the virus. So uh, there's definitely parvo and it hangs around for a long time. So it's a good idea to disinfect the environment that a, a parvo puppy is known to be in. How can we disinfect? Chlorine bleach will kill parvo. Accelerated hydrogen peroxides will kill parvo. Uh, lots of disinfectants will kill parvo. And is parvo zoonotic? No, thank goodness. And remember, zoonotic means it's transferable between animals and people, okay? So parvo not to, uh, not zoonotic. Our next illness, our next canine illness we're going to talk about is infectious canine hepatitis or ICH. So before even looking any further down, don't cheat, don't cheat. Hepatitis. What is a hepatitis? So let's use our word parts to pick this one apart. We have itis as a suffix and hepat as a root. Hepat is liver, itis is inflammation of. So uh, hepatitis is an inflammation of the liver. Canine infectious hepatitis is caused by the canine adenovirus type one. Our next um, illness we're gonna talk about is adenovirus type two. So canine adenovirus type one causes hepatitis. Uh, the incubation period on this guy is four to nine days, so it doesn't take that long to start showing signs. It is transmitted um, from oronasal secretions. So if you come into contact with, um, you know, mucus from the nose or saliva from the mouth or direct contact with the animal. The systems affected are the liver and the kidney and the eyes. So what clinical signs will we see with, uh, with canine infectious hepatitis, or sorry, infectious canine hepatitis? We're gonna see fever, we're gonna see a cough, 
we're going to see hepatitis, obviously. Typically, anytime you have hepatitis, you're going to see jaundice. Uh, if you don't remember, jaundice is a yellowing of the skin. It's a buildup of bilirubin in the body, in the blood, and it causes the skin, the mucous membranes, the eyes uh, to turn yellow. Um, we, we might describe those animals as being icteric. That's another term that means yellow. They'll have vomiting and diarrhea. And they can get uveitis, which uh, turns the eyes kind of a blue color. Um, it's a hepatitis blue eye or uveitis. These animals will be lethargic, which means they're uh, low energy. They'll have polydipsia, so they're increased thirst. Uh, they won't be able to clot as nicely, um, so you'll see prolonged bleeding times. Uh, there's depression, kind of depression I feel like goes alongside with lethargic. Uh, anorexia, they're not eating, and they could have um, clots in the blood. That doesn't make sense to me, that they have prolonged bleeding times, but could also have clots. I'm going to have to look into that. So is this a debilitating illness? It certainly can be. 25% um, that do recover from this are going to have a bilateral corneal opacity. So bilateral, bi means two, lateral means sides. So that means both eyes are affected. The cornea, remember, is the outermost portion of the eye. Like if you touched your eye, it's the part that you would be touching. And opacity means you can't see through it. So that's from that uveitis. It is possible as well that animals that have had ICS end up with chronic hepatitis as well. So hepatitis for life. How long are they shedding the virus? They're shedding it for six to nine months post-infection, and they shed that virus in their urine. Uh, treatment. Can we treat the virus itself? No. So we're gonna be treating with supportive treatment. That's gonna look like IV fluids, blood transfusions, and because of the uveitis, we're gonna protect them from bright lights. Is there a vaccine? Yes. So this the adenovirus type 1 vaccine used to cause a lot of problems in animals. But fortunately for us, the canine adenovirus type 2 protects against type 2 and type 1. So that's beautiful. We can give that adenovirus type 2 vaccine and kind of get a two for one because we can protect against both. So this is a core vaccine. It is the A2 in DA2PP. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about, like we'll talk about the protocol when we talk about the adenovirus type two though. So reoccurrence, uh, no. It, it's believed that you're immune, the animal's immune for life after they've had this one. How do we diagnose? Well, clinical signs and history, that's kind of a always. On blood chemistry, we're gonna see increased liver enzymes. Um, what happens when the liver is damaged, like for instance, by hepatitis, uh, the liver releases uh, enzymes that are exclusive to the liver. So if we see those in the blood, it means that the, that the liver is being damaged in some way. So we'll see increased liver enzymes. When we run a complete blood count or a CBC, we're gonna see that platelets are decreased. Platelets are responsible for clotting. And we're gonna see that there's decreased white blood cells as well. So they might have some issues with, uh, with immunity as well. So prognosis, the animal can die due to those liver and clotting problems. Uh, so um, it can be a fatal illness. In the environment, it is a very resistant bacteria. Heat can kill it and bleach can kill it, which is nice. And then is this guy zoonotic? No. Okay, moving on to our next illness. The illness is canine infectious tracheobronchitis. And it's also commonly known as kennel cough. So let's break apart our word parts on tracheobronchitis. We have trache, we have bronch, 
we have itis. So itis, inflammation of, trachea is the trachea, and bronchi is referring to the bronchi. So that makes sense then that it's a cough, right? Because the trachea and the bronchi are both in the lungs. So if those guys are inflamed, we're gonna see coughing. So what agents cause kennel cough? There are a variety. Canine adenovirus type two is a viral cause. Parainfluenza is a viral cause. And Bordetella bronchoseptica is a bacterial cause. The incubation time on kennel cough is two to seven days. Uh, so it's pretty quick. Come into contact with it, coughing a couple days later. How is it transmitted? It is aerosolized uh, and then inhaled respiratory secretions. So the dog's coughing everywhere, the other dogs are in inhaling the respiratory secretions. It is more likely, it's called kennel cough because it's more likely that these dogs are gonna get this illness from a kennel or a daycare or wherever. Um, wherever they are inside a shelter, like kennel cough is pretty common in shelters. So anywhere that they're um, inside versus like say being around other dogs at like the dog park, uh, it's because they or I mean, sorry, they're gonna get more likely to catch that illness. It's because typically in these kennels, daycares, shelters, etc., there's a higher concentration of dogs and they're in a confined area. There's more potential for direct contact as in they can go and sniff each other and cough all over each other. And there tends to be less air circulation. So those viruses are just hanging around. Okay, so I always tell people when they're asking me like, should I get the vaccine for kennel cough as in the Bordetella vaccine? I always let them know if you're going to have your dog around other dogs, I'm just going to go ahead and recommend you get that back or get that vaccine because it is possible for them to pick it up anywhere they're around other animals, especially if they do things like kennel, daycare, groomer, if they get out all the time and end up at animal services, okay? Bordetella can also affect rabbits, guinea pigs, pigs, and cats. So Bordetella, the vaccine can be given to cats as well, not just dogs, which is interesting. Clinical disease lasts from 10 to 20 days. And honestly, it's usually pretty self-limiting, which means that it just goes away on its own. The systems that are affected is the respiratory tract, which makes sense when it's called a kennel cough, right? Clinical signs we're gonna see, oh, look at that, a cough. <laughs> it tends to be a dry cough and it has a pretty distinct sound. It's likened to a goose honk. So it's kind of that like, oh, I can't even do it. I'm just gonna make myself cough for real. Um, maybe we'll just, uh, I'll try to Google a video and include it. <laughs> um, they can be retching and gagging from the cough. I don't know about you if you've ever had a cough where you've coughed so bad you start um, like kind of vomiting or like retching. That happens to dogs as well. It can pro progress to pneumonia, which is uh, a more complicated illness. If it progresses to pneumonia, they're gonna need some kind of antibiotics to treat. They could have a fever. They could be lethargic. They could have rhinitis. What is rhinitis? Itis is inflammation of, and rhine is referring to the nose. So it's like a runny nose. And then dyspnea, what's that one? Pnea is breathing and dys is difficult or painful. So in this case, it's difficulty breathing. Is this debilitating? I mean, it's annoying, but it usually will be self-limiting, which means it goes away on its own. Here's, oh, in healthy animals. Here's what often happens with kennel cough. The dog gets kennel cough. The dog is coughing for a few days and it's keeping the owner up at night. They bring the dog in at about day four or five and they say, uh, this dog's coughing so much, we need to get it treated. So at that point, typically it's gonna resolve on its own in the next like five days or so. But since the owner is 
disturbed by it, what we're gonna usually do is uh, offer some cough suppressants for the owner to take home. So then that way the dog can have a bit of break from coughing and the owner can get some sleep as well. So honestly, when they bring them in, they probably don't even really need treatment unless it's progressed to like pneumonia, uh, but we'll still offer them some treatment to help them be more comfortable. How long is the dog shedding the virus for? Seven to 14 days. Uh, clinical disease lasts from 10 to 20 days. So it's right in there. If they're coughing, they're spreading it. If we have a dog coming in for coughing, do I want the dog hanging out in the waiting room? No, I don't. I want that dog to wait outside in their car until I have a room ready for them and then I'm gonna get them directly into that room. If I have to stop anywhere along the way, like the scale, let's say, to weigh a larger dog, I'm going to disinfect anything that that dog was near or especially if the dog coughed on anything. It is really contagious kennel cough and it will spread around. So we want to be sure that we are not letting this animal be in the waiting room infecting other animals. Do you remember talking back in office procedures? An animal catching an illness at the vet clinic can be considered malpractice. So we do not want that happening. Any infectious animals that are suspected of having an infectious illness, we should keep in their car and then get directly into a room. How do we treat uh, infectious tracheitis or, or tracheobronchitis or kennel cough? We want to isolate those animals from other dogs. Honestly, other dogs in the household are probably affected already, uh, but they shouldn't be going to dog park, kennel, um, boarding, grooming, anything like that. We do not need to treat. I've already said that it is self-limiting. However, if the cough is bothering the owner, we can send them home with an antitussive. An antitussive is a cough suppressant. We can also give them the advice to bring them into the bathroom with them when they're having a shower. We can introduce a vaporizer to the area that the dog is sleeping in. Those things, just like they help us when we have a cold or an upper respiratory infection, it can help the dogs as well. Cats too. When we get to cats, we'll talk about that. Uh, if it is severe and it's turned into pneumonia, they're going to need antibiotics to treat that pneumonia. Uh, are there vaccines? Yes, canine adenovirus type 2 is a core vaccine. It's packaged with distemper and parvo. Parainfluenza is not a core vaccine, but since it's included in the DA2PP, uh, it just ends up give, getting given on that core schedule. So DA2PP, I'll remind you, is distemper, adenovirus type 2, which also protects against adenovirus type 1, parvo, and parainfluenza. Commit that to memory. People are going to ask, what does DA2PP mean even? And you can be the super smart person that says, oh, it's actually protecting your animal against one, two, three, four, five different illnesses. And they'll be like, oh, wow, five? Which ones? And then you can share distemper, adenovirus type one, also adenovirus type, or sorry, type two, and then also adenovirus type one, parainfluenza and parvo. And they'll be like, oh, wow, that's so worth my money. I can't believe that vaccine's only $16. So anyway, what I'm trying to get at is it's super worth it to vaccinate your dogs. So core vaccines are always given on the same schedule. Puppies get them at 8, 12, and 16 weeks. We booster them after one year, and then we give them every two to three years after. Bordetella is available as a separate vaccine, and it is non-core. So remember, core vaccines should be given to all animals in a species. Non-core vaccines are given only to the animals that are at high risk of contracting that illness. So your little Yorkie that never leaves your apartment probably doesn't need the Bordetella vaccine. If you have a dog that goes boarding or to the groomer, or to doggy daycare or the dog park even, I would recommend getting the Bordetella vaccine. 
Anytime your dog's hanging out with other dogs, it has the potential of, of contracting kennel cough. In Winnipeg a few years ago, there was a big outbreak of kennel cough. And everyone came in to get their vaccines. A lot of them also came in for treatment because there was so much kennel cough. That was a pretty remarkable year. What if a pup gets uh, kennel cough? Well, any pup, any, any age of animal is susceptible if they're not vaccinated. Uh, so puppies can get it, adults can get it, anyone can get it. It's self-limiting in pups as well. Pups are more likely to get pneumonia with it though, because they are not as, uh, you know, kids, um, like young animals, old animals are considered immune compromised. Uh, is it possible for there to be a recurrence of this illness? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I've seen dogs get kennel cough many, many times. Diagnosis, clinical signs and history will certainly help us to diagnose this. Your dog has a goose honk cough. You just got back from a vacation when he was boarding, it's kennel cough. But we can do a reliable clinical diagnosis test. And that is if we pinch or palpate, remember palpate is examined by feeling. If we pinch or palpate the windpipe, it will produce the goose honk cough. So that can confirm for us that it is kennel cough. There are um, viral tests that you can send away to outside labs, but they're fairly expensive. Usually we're going to go ahead and assume it's kennel cough and send home the antitussive, and it usually just goes away on their own. Prognosis is really excellent because like I said, it's self-limiting and it goes away on its own. However, if the animal gets secondary pneumonia, it is a worse prognosis depending on the severity of the pneumonia. So in the environment, the virus can survive on hands and clothes. So you should be wearing gloves and a lab coat if you are handling the animal so that you're not spreading it around to other animals. Bleach and uh, like the accelerated hydrogen peroxides for sure will kill the virus. Zoonotic, is, is Bordetella zoonotic? Well, I'll tell you now, adenovirus and parainfluenza are not zoonotic, uh, but Bordetella is related to whooping cough. So if you are immunocompromised or you have children in the home with a dog that has a Bordetella-based kennel cough, it is possible that they could be affected by it. The problem is if we diagnose an animal with kennel cough, we don't honestly know if it's caused by adenovirus type 2, parainfluenza, or Bordetella unless we were to send away com confirmation tests. So if you have children or immune compromised people in the house, it might be a good idea to just keep them separate while the dog is sick, just to be on the safe side and uh, make sure you're disinfecting any areas that the dog is around or coughs in or that the children frequent. Our next um, illness is commonly called the dog flu. It's canine influenza virus or CIV. The agent that causes it is H3N8, with, which originated in horses, and H3N2, which originated from avians. H3N2 can also affect some cats. The incubation period on this guy is two to four days, so very quick. Transmission, like most flu viruses, it's aerosolized respiratory secretions. Well, I feel like this should be under the environment section, but on fomites, um, fomites are objects or your hands, that kind of thing. Um, and vectors, which are people, uh, it can last just a few hours, so not super long. Clinical disease, so how long are they sick for? Anywhere between 10 and, pardon me, 10 and 30 days. What systems are affected? The respiratory tract, like most flu vi viruses. Clinical signs are gonna look a lot like flu in uh, humans. So they're gonna be, um, if they have a mild case of the flu, they'll feel lethargic, right? No energy. Anorexic, they won't want to eat. They have a fever. They'll have clear nasal discharge and they'll have a dry, non-productive cough. 
So I'm not sure, I don't think we've talked about cough types yet. A non-productive cough is a dry cough. You're not coughing anything up when you cough. It's like a hacking cough. If you have a productive cough, when you cough, like mucus is coming up from your lungs. So those are two different types of coughs. With the flu here, it'll be a dry cough. If the case is fairly severe, it's going to be a high fever. The animal could have dyspnea, which remember is difficulty breathing. If their cough is severe, they could even be coughing up blood. They could get pneumonia or a secondary bacterial infection. That two with a degree sign means secondary. Typically though, most healthy animals are just gonna have a mild case. Severe cases are gonna be the young, the old, and the immunocompromised. Those are the types of animals that are most susceptible to uh, infectious diseases like this. Is the canine influenza virus debilitating? Uh, in about 10 to 20% of animals that are infected with the flu virus, they are subclinical. What does subclinical mean? They have the virus, but they do not show clinical signs. So they don't even know that they're sick. The remaining 80 to 90% will have clinical signs. And of that 80 to 90%, only one to 20% will have those severe clinical signs. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's exceptionally debilitating. They likely will um, recover unless uh, they get that uh, severe signs where they're getting pneumonia or the bacterial infection because that is gonna be dependent on the severity of that. How long are they shedding virus for? Um, two to four, wait, sorry, what am I trying to say here? How long are they shedding virus? Oh, they, they shed it from two to four days post-infection up to seven days. So they're not shedding it for all that long compared to uh, some of those other ones we talked about. Treatment, can we treat the flu virus itself? No. So we are going to offer supportive treatment to treat the clinical signs. We can give the animal anti-inflammatories, uh, that can help to bring down the fever, help with any pain they're feeling. We can give them cough suppressants to help them feel more comfortable and get a little bit of a break from the cough. If secondary infections are present, they will need to be treated with antibiotics. Uh, is there a vaccine? Yes, it's non-core. I'll be honest, I've never seen it. I've never used it in clinic. Can pups contract it? Yes, any unvaccinated dog is susceptible. So I would say probably like all the dogs are susceptible because I've never known a dog to be vaccinated for this. Is it possible for reoccurrence? Yes. Like most flus, they, people just, uh, you know, you often get sick from the flu is what I'm trying to say. How do we diagnose the flu? So clinical signs and history, like all diagnosis, but the issue here is that we can't really distinguish between this and kennel cough that has gotten severe unless we send out some confirming tests to an outside lab. So we can confirm, confirm with an ELISA test. Um, so remember that's uh, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Um, that is testing for antigens. So the, uh, remember the antigen is going to be on the virus itself. So that proves that what we have is that virus in the body. We can also send out a blood serology. That's going to test for antibodies to that virus. Does that confirm that the animal currently has that virus? No. What do we know about antibodies? They hang around. We have antibodies to every illness we've, we've contracted, right? Those hang around in the body for a long time. All an antibody test proves is that the animal has been exposed to this virus. So an ELISA test that's testing for antigens is gonna be a more reliable test. 
So both those tests are things we have to send out to an outside lab. There are no in-clinic versions of those tests. Prognosis for the dog flu is generally good because the vast majority either don't have clinical signs at all or have mild clinical signs. Most animals are going to recover in the two to three weeks. If pneumonia is present, however, uh, prognosis could be grave. A grave prognosis means it's fairly likely that the animal could die. In the environment, the virus only lasts a few hours. It doesn't say here, but things like bleach and the accelerated peroxide are going to kill those flu viruses. And is H3N8 or H3N2 zoonotic? No, fortunately for us, there are many, many flu viruses that are zoonotic, but those two are not. And our last virus that we're talking about in this section is the uh, herpes virus. So herpes virus causes fading puppy syndrome in dogs. Uh, is anyone right now saying like herpes? Wait a second. I didn't know dogs could get herpes. So herpes is just a type of virus. Uh, so this is not the same herpes that you're thinking of that affects humans. So herpes in humans can cause uh, genital herpes. It can cause cold sores. <coughs> uh, so it doesn't cause that in dogs. Um, one thing that's unique about herpes viruses is that they stay in your body for life. So you might already have an idea that that's the case because I'm sure if you yourself get cold sores or you know someone that gets cold sores um, that uh, they, you get them periodically and typically they arrive during times of stress or illness. So herpes viruses stay dormant in nerve cells and then when they become active or reactivated again, they, uh, they cause periodic shedding of that virus, okay? So that's something that's really, I think, interesting about those herpes viruses. And there's um, a herpes virus for probably every species. Uh, cats and dogs definitely have herpes viruses. Humans have herpes virus. There's a herpes virus that monkeys have, that if humans catch it, it's fatal. Humans that have a herpes virus, uh, if, that, if that herpes virus gets contracted by a monkey, the monkey will die. So I think that's fairly interesting. Um, like I definitely get cold sores. So I have dormant herpes virus hanging out in my nerves, in my lips. And uh, I would not be allowed to work with monkeys. Like if I wanted to get a lab job or something, I wouldn't be allowed to work with monkeys because it's potential that I could kill them with that virus. Pretty wild. And, oh wait, never mind, that's chlamydia. I was going to talk about koalas, but koalas have chlamydia. <laughs> I'm sure they have a herpes virus too. I just don't know for sure. Uh, incubation time on the herpes virus is six to 10 days. And it's tr transmitted by direct contact with bodily secretions or it could be transferred in utero or during birth to pups. Clinical disease lasts one to three days. It's very short and we'll see why shortly. The systems that are affected in an adult, it affects the reproductive system, which explains why it can be contracted in utero or during birth. And it can affect the uh, respiratory system as well. In pups, it affects their entire body. Clinical signs that you'll see in adults, you might see some eye or nose discharge. That's from the respiratory uh, uh, system. Sorry, that's from the respiratory system being affected. We could see vaginitis. Let's pick that one apart. Uh, itis, inflammation of vagina, the vagina. Uh, it could cause infertility in the, uh, in the adult dog, and it could cause stillborn pups, which means that they're born uh, deceased. In pups, they have a very uh, distinct plaintive crying that sounds kind of like a seagull. So it's often called a seagull cry. They have yellow-green stool, usually in the form of diarrhea. They will be uncomfortable because they've got a painful abdomen. 
They'll have nasoocular discharge, so nose and eye, runny nose and eye. They'll have low temperatures. They tend to have a loss of condition. Uh, condition is referring to like, um, like, like we're talking body condition. So typically they're kind of like losing weight and like fading away, right? That's why it's called fading puppy syndrome. These animals lose their suckling reflex, which means that they're not drinking milk from the mum. They tend to stay, or I mean, fail to stay with the mother or the litter, which also explains those low body temperatures. And um, they fail to gain weight because they're not, uh, they don't have that suckling reflex and they're not eating. So they generally just fade away and then they do die. So is this debilitating in adults? Not really. It might be, um, inconvenient if you are planning on breeding your dog and they're dealing with infertility, but it doesn't affect them the way it does pups. Pups that have this herpes virus, almost 100% of those pups will die. So it is very debilitating for the very young. Treatment. Can we treat a herpes virus? No, we can't treat the virus itself. Even antivirals won't treat the herpes virus. They can because it just stays dormant in the nerve cells. So herpes will not go away. So what can we do? We can do supportive treatment, but honestly, it's usually unsuccessful. And those pups generally will die. We want to keep bitches away from other dogs three weeks before and after birth. That protects the, um, the mother and the pups from contracting that virus during that time. And we would like to obviously isolate pups from infected adults. I feel like if you have herpes virus in your, uh, in your dog kennel, like a breeding kennel, um, you're, you're not being a very responsible breeder. Is there a vaccine for this? Unfortunately, no. What age of pups is most affected is, um, well, less than two to three weeks. So we're talking like really neonate puppies, like younger than two to three weeks. Reoccurrence. So, I mean, those any pups that have it are gonna die, but adults, like we said, they're lifelong carriers and they will periodically shed that virus. How do we diagnose this illness? Well, clinical signs and history obviously are going to help us diagnose. They always do. We can do a blood titer for antibodies to the virus, and that can confirm if that pup has been exposed or if the uh, parent pup has, or parent dog has been exposed. Prognosis, guarded to grave in pups. So a grave diagnosis means that they're going to die. A guarded diagnosis means it's really likely they're gonna die. Is this specific herpes virus zoonotic? No, thank goodness, because we don't need more things to worry about in the vet clinic. All right, so that's the last of um, our first section here of dog illnesses. So hopefully you found this lecture helpful. If you do have any questions, please do ask them in the chat or the virtual classroom or send me an email. Thank you so much for listening.